Hi guys and welcome to our look at the Louisiana Purchase. Um, forgive me if I'm really bad at recording notes because it's the first time I've ever done this. But on your handout, I want you to, as the bell work says, I want you to make kind of the skeleton outline of this thing down here. Um, put Louisiana Purchase in the middle. Leave a little bit of room for a few things underneath it and then put the six uh, spikes out from the center of your web. If you hear someone humming, it's my son who's supposed to be quiet right now, but really wants to get in on this. Asa, tell everybody hi. Hi. Okay, so that's Ace. All right, so Lee, also on your paper, imagine that your paper ends up here and over here. Leave some room to write, so you don't have to make these spokes really long. It looks longer on this, but just do a little short. So write Louisiana Purchase, leave space do six short spokes we're actually going to start here go from here to here to here to here to here to here notice some of these are kind of bigger so leave a good bit of space uh, so you can go ahead and pause the video and do that now okay so today we're talking about the louisiana purchase and you've already seen this on the maps that you colored after the test but the louisiana purchase is this area of land right here, including the modern state of Louisiana, but then extending all the way up the Mississippi and all the way over here, um, not including Texas. So that huge chunk of land. And we get the Louisiana Purchase from France. Uh, Napoleon was in charge at the time. He was emperor and he wanted to take over Europe. And to do that, he needed a lot of money to finance his wars. And so he decided when the Americans came to him, we actually came to him to buy New Orleans, which sits right down here. We wanted to buy the area around New Orleans so we could use the Mississippi River. Um, he said to the delegates there, why don't you just take all of it? And so we bought the entire Louisiana Purchase and it doubled the size of our country almost instantaneously. Okay, so most of today's lecture is not about the purchase itself, but rather how it impacts a variety of people within our country. So let's look at six people or six groups that it impacts. The first person we want to talk about today is President Jefferson. Uh, he is the guy who authorizes the Louisiana Purchase. Remember, he gets elected in 1800. The Louisiana Purchase is completed in 1803. Now, something we know about President Jefferson is that usually he believed in strict construction, which means only doing what is specifically written in the Constitution. And that was a big difference between the Democratic Republicans led by Jefferson and the Federalist Party led by Hamilton. However, there is nothing in the Constitution that allows the president to buy land. Technically, that's Congress's job. However, he did not want to go to Congress because he knew that Napoleon, being a dictator, could very easily change his mind. And he was worried that if he went to Congress, they would take so long debating it and deciding on it that Napoleon would just change his mind. So he kind of gave up his beliefs a little bit because he knew that buying these this land was what was in the best interests of the country. Okay, so President Jefferson, if you need to pause the video and write anything down, feel free. Our next group that we're talking about are settlers. You might have seen things like this. We have a wagon train with covered wagons going across the prairie. And so this is how people got west back in the early 1800s. And of course, the Louisiana purchases a, a big impact on settlers. In some way or for some reason, there was a group of people in America or a type of person in America at this time that just really wanted to move west. Uh, they would start off, say, in New York, and then they would move to western New York and live there for a little while. Then that wouldn't be west enough, so they'd move to Ohio, and then they'd live there for a while, and then they would move to Illinois, and they would just keep pushing west, and then their children would move west, and it was just something deep within them. So this group of people who just really wanted to get out and away from everyone um, enjoyed the Louisiana Purchase. They got more land to move to. They went west on these wagon trails. 
you can see this in the map here, a map of some famous wagon trails, this one being the Oregon Trail that that classic education game is named after. Uh, so there were certain ways that you went. It's not like it was a paved road. It's just a path that you followed. And when they went out there, they would create homesteads by staking out land and farming on it. And essentially, I mean, we would almost call them squatters today, but it wasn't illegal to do that. Um, they just went and, and staked out some land and farmed it. And interestingly enough, this was not part of America yet. Uh, this was part of Mexico and this was part of Britain. Yes, thank you, Prezi.com, for telling me. Um, this was part of Britain, but they would go anyway because those areas were so sparsely populated by those nationalities that they could get away with it. So settlers. On to the next group, voters. An odd jump from settlers to voters, but a very important link uh, in the, the concepts here today. The reason this impacted voters, if you will think back to our look at colonial America, a lot of the voting requirements were tied to land ownership, especially in the middle colonies in the south, and that continued to be true when we became an independent country, that you had to own land to vote. So, because of the, the huge amount of land available, that land requirement for voting was actually dropped in all places. So you no longer had to own land to vote. They made a law that all white males could vote. And while that gave the right to vote to a lot of people who could not vote before, it also took away the rights of African Americans, women, Native Americans, who had previously been able to vote because they own land, but now under the new law were not able to vote. And so the Louisiana Purchase and Land Expansion gives the voting rights to some, but takes away the voting rights for others. And that links into our next group, the Democrats. Now we have been calling them Democratic Republicans for a while, and this is actually when that second half gets dropped and they're just known as the Democrats. So obviously Jefferson was a Democrat, and then he is followed by James Madison, um, Monroe, and then later Andrew Jackson. And so he, there's this long string of Democratic presidents because the Democrats are gonna gain a lot of power from land expansion. And here's why. One reason is because they gain new voters. When the land requirement is dropped for voting, all of the people who gained the right to vote tended to vote Democrat. Uh, the Federalist was the party of the wealthy and the elite, so they already could vote because they already own land. Federalists don't increase, don't increase the number of voters voting for them, but the Democrats do. So now there are all these new people voting and they're all voting Democrat. In addition to that, the Louisiana Purchase was an extremely popular thing, and since Jefferson was the one behind it, the Democrats get a lot of political uh, credit for the Louisiana Purchase, and they gain in popularity. Fast forwarding a couple decades, notice this is 1829 to 1837, but we're hopping a little bit forward in time to talk about Andrew Jackson here for a moment. He is the next major prominent Democratic president. Uh, and if you ever see a picture with a guy with really wild hair, yes, thank you, Prezi.com, uh, see a guy with really wild hair and, and crazy eyebrows, that is Andrew Jackson. And he was a very interesting president. Um, he is considered the first Western president because he was not born in one of the original 13 colonies. He was born out in Kentucky, and so he was Western because Kentucky was West back then. Um, he is seen as a champion of the common man. This is a, a time in politics where you don't want to be an elitist because, of course, the Federalists were elitists. The Democrats, they were average people. And so he got a lot of support because people thought of him as an average guy. He actually gains fame coming up through the military rather than for, you know, wealth and land ownership. He, he makes a career out of, for himself in the military. And he championed the interests of farmers and land expansion. And of course, what did settlers and farmers want? They wanted more land even beyond Louisiana Purchase. And so Andrew Jackson kind of rides that wave of democratic popularity right on into the White House. And he's going to be a key figure in this uh, time period. Okay, next group of people we're talking about 
are slaves, slave owners, and abolitionists. So this slavery category is actually going to split into three smaller groups. Um, and slavery is going to change a little bit. Here we see what slavery becomes, and that is picking cotton. Uh, cotton becomes the dominant crop of American, uh, of the American South after Eli Whitney invents the cotton gin in the late 1790s. And suddenly, uh, what was once going away, the institution of slavery was seen by many as dying out, now gets revived and, and doubled, tripled, quadrupled um, in the South when cotton production uh, they said cotton became king. Cotton was king. Now to the slave owners, what territory expansion meant to them was the extension of slavery. So slave owners wanted to expand slavery into the new territory. And they they saw all of that new land as just new places to plant cotton because cotton could be grown from the Midlands of Carolina all the way to Texas. And so any new land could be more land to grow cotton. And so, of course, they wanted those new areas to be able to have slaves. Abolitionists, on the other hand, were worried that if they expanded slavery into the new territory, slavery would be around forever. We talked a little bit when we were looking at the Declaration of Independence that a lot of the founding fathers thought slavery would die out. And that's what they're kind of counting on. And people who wanted to get rid of slavery in the late 1700s thought, if we're just patient enough, it's going to go away. And maybe we can hurry it along, but that's all we're going to do. In the 1800s, now people realize that, no, it's not going to go away. If slavery gets into the new territories, it's going to be there forever. And this is where the push to outlaw slavery begins, where they once thought it would just go away. Now it's we might actually have to pass laws to outlaw it. Uh, and this is why, and we will see this as we go into our next unit on the Civil War, territory expansion and the debate over slavery are going to be 100% linked. The one is going to bring up the other. And so land expansion and slavery get uh, all intertwined. And of course, we need to talk about the slaves themselves. Uh, obviously, uh, one giant downside of being a slave, which is kind of a dumb thing to say, but one issue slaves had to face was being separated from their families when um, people were sold or people were taken away. You had no control over where your family was. In early colonial times, that might mean just to the next plantation owner over, but now that that land is expanding and there's more and more of it, some slaves were taken west, others weren't, and so families were separated even more drastically than they had before. And our last group, and certainly not least, are the Native Americans, because it's very important to remember none of this land we're expanding into is empty. It might seem empty to Americans, because we are used to city uh, cities and dense settlement, but um, the Native Americans consider it occupied and it's theirs. And one of the effects of this new land expansion isn't just the Native Americans that already lived in that new land, but the Native Americans that lived in the, the old land that already was America. Um, the most famous law dealing with Native Americans at this time is the Indian Removal Act of 1830. And that law forces all Indians to leave the East and to go to Oklahoma. Okay, pardon if this is bumpy, I'd pause it to talk to someone. Oh, what was I saying? Look, I'm even distracted when I record my lectures. Okay, so the Indians had to leave the East and go to Oklahoma. And let's go to this map and look at that. And it's, it's really important to remember where they're coming from, where are they going to, because it does not deal with all of these Native Americans uh, who lived in the Louisiana Territory. It deals with the Native Americans that lived in what was already American territory. The Cherokee, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, um, the, the Seminole. They are being forced out of the East and put into the new ter territory into Oklahoma. 
There was uh, certain tribes that tried to fight against this. They were known as the five civilized tribes uh, because they had adopted a, lot, adopted a lot of American ways of life, uh, spoke English, uh, settled down and had farms, had plantations. Some of them even had slaves. And so they were trying to fight in the courts that they were allowed to stay in the East. Uh, in one famous court case, the Supreme Court said, well, you're not technically American, so we can't hear your case. Uh, and they threw out the case. In another one, someone sued on behalf of the Native Americans, and it was between the state of Georgia and the the uh, Cherokee tribe. And the Cherokee said that the Georgians didn't have a right to kick them off their land because they had made a treaty with the national government. And on that case, the Supreme Court agreed with them and it was up to Andrew Jackson to enforce that ruling. And Andrew Jackson said, no, I'm not enforcing that. I don't care. Uh, because it's actually Andrew Jackson who pushed for the Indian Removal Act. Um, it was his idea, and he pushed Congress to enforce it. He was known as an Indian fighter. That's one of the things he did in the military, and he was not interested in having Native Americans stay in the East. He thought that what was best for them was to move them. Um, of course, the, the famous incident is the Trail of Tears. It was not one force march. It was actual several marches that we think of collectively where the military went into Native American settlements and by gunpoint or bayonet point or whatever forced the Native Americans to march out of their territory and march them all the way to um, Oklahoma and a lot of people died of exposure. They did this despite the seasons um, in the middle of winter, which even though we're in the south, it gets cold, it snows, there's freezing rain. And so a lot of people died on that march and it's a rather nasty bit of American history. And so there you have it, the Louisiana Purchase and its effect on all different types of people in our country.